Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, today we are going to talk about the bioethics of tissue engineering. So, we have discussed tissue engineering, we have now seen the different aspects of tissue engineering, what promises it holds. However, with any advanced development, especially in the areas uh, related to human life, the ethics becomes a major question. So, it is important for us to look at the ethical questions which need to be addressed well while we are performing research when it comes to tissue engineering. So, today we will be talking about the different ethical questions which are posed for the researchers and also the society when it comes to the area of tissue engineering. So, when you first talk about the, uh, bioethics, the first aspect which I would like for you to know about is the difference between ethics and regulations. So, please think for a minute what is ethics and what, what are regulations. So, do you understand that they are different or do you think they are the same? So, think about this, ethics are basically moral guidelines which are based on individual values. So, what are regulations then? Regulations are basically rules which are imposed by an external agency. So, the fundamental difference is ethics is based on our own morals. So, it could either be what an individual person believes or the society believes or his religion believes versus regulations being what governmental agencies actually enforce. So, regulations are usually from external forces. However, in an ideal society, the ethics should be of higher standards than regulations. So, it is important that we understand this difference. Today, we will be focused on the ethics of these issues. Regulations of tissue engineering is a whole another debate which involves a lot more uh, legal issues which is which will not be discussed as part of this course. So, when we are talking about regulations, we said that it is enforced by external agencies. So, can you name a few such agencies? Think about it. What would be the external agencies which ha act as regulatory bodies when it comes to biotechnology? Most of you would have thought of FDA which is the Food and Drug Administration in the US. So, this organization is the one which approves uh, what is used for food products and what are used as drugs and these are all, this is also the agency which approves medical instruments and also any, any of the tissue engineered products which might actually reach the market. However, this is an agency which is set up by the United States government and it is actually uh, implemented only for the US. So, you could get an FDA approval, but that is only required if it needs to be marketed in the US. However, if you are looking for uh, something to be marketed in India, where do you go? Where do you get the approvals? So, in India, you have two regulatory bodies, one is the FSSAI which approves the food related uh, products and then you have the CDSCO which is the Central Drug Standard Control Organization. So, these two regulatory bodies actually approve uh, food and drug related uh, products when it comes to India. Now, as I mentioned, we will not be talking about regulations, which means we will not be talking about the agencies which are involved in the policy make making, the regulations which are governing the ethical debates. Uh, one of the reasons we would not be talking about these is, uh, these can actually vary from country to country or even state to state depending on the values of that particular environment. So, 
we will focus primarily on the larger debates which are the ethical dilemmas. So, we will uh, focus on major questions which are posed in front of us when we talk about tissue engineering. So, this uh, area is called as bioethics. So, bioethics is basically the study of ethical issues related to advances in biology and medicine. So, as tissue engineering ultimately wants to be uh, uh, developing a product which can help in uh, improving the quality of life of people and develop into a biomedical product. So, bioethics governs how tissue engineering research should be carried out. So, when we are talking about uh, bioethics, what are the factors? What actually influences bioethics or even ethics in general? You can have legal factors, the rules that can guide what is right and wrong. So, these are basically rules which are enforced and this if somebody uh, does not have their own guidelines, the legal guidelines which are set forth by the external agencies will act as the ethical guidelines as well. So, that is not the highest standard that needs to be met. So, you could also have organizational factors. So, organizational factors depend on the ethics of the leader or the values imbibed through policies and publications and speeches by the organization. For example, you could be working in a company where there would be certain rules about what to wear or the timings in which you need to work and these are policies which are implemented by the company. So, you have these organizational factors which decide how you actually behave. So, the ethical guidelines here are not just dependent on the legal bodies, but on the organizational uh, bodies. So, technically these are not uh, binding because you can actually leave the company and go to a different place. There is no law forcing you to work in that company. So, by choosing to work there, you have agreed to abide by the organizational values of the uh, place where you are working. So, this could also apply to colleges or uh, in general any society. In a family get, uh, get together, you would have a certain organizational value which may be unsaid, but you still have to follow them because that is how your family would function. So, that is the organizational factor. Then comes the more important factor which is the individual factor. As an individual, all of us have our own moral standing. So, when we have these moral standings, this is what will drive us towards doing something or not doing something. We need to realize what can be done and what should not be done and that comes from our own belief system. It could be either the moral development or the personal values and personality. It could also be religious influences or family and peer influences. It could be life exper experience or situational factors. So, these are the governing factors when you are talking about how an individual behaves. So, moral development is based on so many things right. So, you need to have a certain set of values on different issues and this comes from who you are, this defines who you are and personal values and personality. So, there may be certain things I would feel uncomfortable doing, however, someone else might be more comfortable doing and that comes simply because of the personality. There can also be religious influences, all of us follow our own religion. Individual religions have different guidelines which people follow. There are religions which would restrict certain activities, whereas other religions might not be so strict. So, depending on the religious beliefs, somebody might actually follow or do certain things while the others might not and this plays a huge role in how a person behaves. Family and peer influences. Looking at your peers and your family, you learn values. Looking at your parents, you know what they do and what they do not do. If, if a parent uh, does not stop at a red light when this in a signal, then the kid assumes that it is ok to do that, although the legal uh, guidelines say otherwise. So, the values are imbibed by looking at the peers and your family. Life experiences would also change your values. So, as you grow, there are more experiences you have, you see more things. 
So, based on that your value system will evolve. Some of the values you would have held dear when you were younger would not be seen as such strict things and things might change over a period of time. The last and the crucial factor is the situational factor. There are certain things which we would find repugnant today when we have all the uh, facilities and amenities. However, when we are pushed to a corner, then the situation might demand us to cross a line which we would not cross today. So, how do we um, uh, take all these factors when we are looking at ethics? So, when we are talking about bioethics, all these factors can play a role. So, we will talk about some of the major questions which, uh, which actually haunt the field of biology and even tissue engineering specifically, which actually need to be addressed and discussed. So, we will first talk about one of the major ethical debates when it comes to tissue engineering, it is the embryonic stem cells. So, what are embryonic stem cells? First, we need to know what are stem cells. So, in this lecture, in this course, we have already discussed what stem cells are. So, I am assuming you would already know what stem cells are. So, if you do not, basically, stem cells are uh, cells which actually can differentiate to different types of cells. These do not have the functionalities already determined, they can differentiate to form different cells. They are also self renewing cells. So, this, this is what a stem cell is. So, what is an embryonic stem cell and why is it so special? An embryonic stem cell is a cell which is obtained from the embryo. So, these stem cells have much higher uh, potency, these are pluripotent and that actually makes it very useful tool, use it, uh, makes them a useful tool for uh, research. So, what are the other types of stem cells? There are many other types of stem cells. You can actually find stem cells in all parts of your body. So, you have the mesenchymal stem cells, you have the hematopoietic stem cells, you can have uh, adipose derived stem cells and many other dental pulp has stem cells. Stem cells can be found in many parts of your body. So, why is the fuss about embryonic stem cells? As I mentioned, these are pluripotent stem cells, which means they have a lot more potency when it comes to differentiating and growing. So, recent uh, research has also shown that the somatic cells can actually be converted to uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So, these, uh, these are called as the IPSCs or induced pluripotent stem cells. So, by in, uh, incorporating certain transcription factors, the somatic cells can be converted to pluripotent stem cells uh, which are called as the IPSCs. So, these are the different types of stem cells. So, as I already mentioned, embryonic stem cells show pluripotency and that is why there has been a lot of free interest in working on embryonic stem cells. So, before we look at the ethical question about embryonic stem cells, we need to understand how embryonic stem cells are obtained. So, what you do is first step is fertilization of an egg and uh, you create an embryo and this embryo is allowed to grow till it reaches a stage called the blastocyst. So, in the blastocyst you have an inner cell mass which is basically the uh, mixture of cells which contains the embryonic stem cells. So, from this uh, mixture uh, from this inner cell mass you obtain the embryonic stem cells. So, the fertilized egg which grows to a blastocyst is actually disrupted. To, uh, to get your uh, embryonic stem cells and these embryonic stem cells can then be uh, differentiated to form different types of cells. It could form endoderm, mesoderm and ectoderm cells and for this reason there has been a lot of interest in looking at embryonic stem cells. Now, what is the ethical dilemma? So, the major question which plagues the discussion on uh, bioethics of embryonic stem cells is you need to choose between two moral principles. The first principle is the duty to prevent and alleviate suffering. As human beings, we, ha we have to prevent or minimize suffering. When you see somebody who is suffering, you should try to do what you can to help them and alleviate the suffering. 
So, this is one of the moral guidelines which humans are driven by. The other guideline is duty to respect the value of human life. Human life is one of the most precious things. We need to value it and we cannot uh, sabotage it. So, these are two principles which end up being conflicting when you talk about embryonic stem cell research. There is actually no way to respect both when you are uh, working on embryonic stem cells. So, what happens here is to obtain embryonic stem cells an early embryo has to be destroyed which means you are destroying potential human life. But embryonic stem cell research can lead to treatments that can alleviate suffering. So, now these are two guidelines which we said are moral guidelines which we are driven by moral principles that we are driven by, but these end up being conflicting when you talk about embryonic stem cell research. So, that is what makes it a hard question to answer. How do we decide which is more important? So, do we say that alleviating suffering and preventing suffering is way more important or do we say that respecting the value of human life is way more important? So, this is dependent on how we view the embryo. Embryo can be seen in different ways and what do we see it as is the question. So, the ethical question we are faced with is when does life start? So, life uh, starting at the time of conception is one of the beliefs. Legally, life starts only at birth, right? uh, but you have to decide when exactly life starts for addressing this question. Can we come to a consensus on that? That is the million dollar question. So, the status of the embryo is a complex question. There are many, many viewpoints when it comes to how, a, how an embryo should be viewed, whether the embryo should have rights, whether it should be treated as equal as a human or whether it should not be, whether it should be treated only as a mass of tissue or mass of cells. So, how do you actually view an embryo? So, we will talk about some of the common viewpoints. We will talk about some of the common viewpoints here. Embryo has full moral status from fertilization onwards. So, this belief is what say where you believe that life starts at conception. So, what you are uh, saying here is an embryo as soon as it is formed the time after fertilization it needs to be treated equally like a human. So, this is a uh, one of the arguments. However, if you were to believe in this then embryonic stem cell research cannot be done. So, this would also mean uh, abortions which are done to save lives uh, of the mother or even for uh, other reasons if there is a non viable embryo and you still think that it needs to be just, uh, it needs to be protected. So, then that would be the guideline driven by the moral status of thinking embryo has full moral status as th at the time of fertilization itself. There is also a group of people who believe that embryo has should have a for, uh, full moral status after 14 days of fertilization. Why 14 days? What is the specialty there? So, after 14 days the embryo is implanted and it does not have a chance to actually divide to become twins. So, once in the first 14 days is when it can actually form twins. So, this uh, means that the uh, belief is after 14 days the embryo has reached a stage where it is now has the potential to form human life. So, within 14 days the embryo could also be lost without implantation. So, we people believe the 14 day cutoff would be a good point to start. So, if this is going to be the guideline then how does this uh, control embryonic stem cell research? How do we then proceed? So, that is another question. The third option uh, which people believe in is embryo has an increasing status as it develops. So, an embryo at the time of fertilization has no st uh, moral status. However, as it develops into more uh, of a human form 
you would have more of a right as a human. So, this uh, is one of the generally accepted views. And the last one is an embryo has no moral status at all. So, until the time of birth life does not start. So, these are the four different views and people see it uh, differently and based on how one sees it the ethical guidelines which are driving the embryonic stem cell research would also evolve. However, there is no scientific consensus on when life starts. So, this needs to be stated because there is no scientific consensus there is no real way of saying this is the point at which life starts. You can only decide on that based on your belief system it is not based on any scientific proof. So, one of the compromises which people have looked at is to use spare embryos from fertility treatment. So, people have been doing IVFs or the in vitro fertilization to have um, kids and in that case what happens is uh, eggs are fertilized to form multiple embryos and not all of them are used for uh, being placed in a, in a womb for further gr uh, growth to a human being. However, embryos uh, which are uh, which are not used are actually discarded. So, people have said that okay, these embryos are anyways going to be discarded. So, why not use them for embryonic stem cell research. Now, the question is uh, are there arguments for and against this as well uh, as one would expect there are. So, we will talk about some of the arguments which support using uh, spare embryos and the arguments which oppose using spare embryos. Embryos have been created for uh, IVF treatment and will be destroyed when it is not implanted and this has been done for many years and this has not changed how we value life. So, it is not a problem. However, here, uh, the argument against this point is human embryos could be exploited as therapeutic agents which can decrease the re respect for human life. So, when you are only doing it for IVF you are actually not intentionally creating it as therapeutic agents you are creating it with the hope of creating a human life. Whereas, when you start doing it as a creating it for therapeutic agents for therapy then what you are doing is you are intending to create them for a different use which might lead to an abuse. So, these are the two arguments which are put forth. And the next thing is many embryos are created in, FRE, uh, in IVF which are not implanted and are actually left to perish. So, the moral dilemma of uh, ending human life is not applicable here. So, you are actually anyways uh, going to destroy them. So, it is not like you are destroying human life because it is it, it is being done already, but the argument against it is this is a slippery slope. So, what can happen is potentially people can start creating embryos with the sole goal of destroying them for therapeutic purposes which is not an acceptable thing for many people. So, this is where the issue comes in when it comes to this argument. There is also uh, the argument which is put forth saying that it is better to use these spare embryos for research rather than to let it go to waste. However, uh, the argument against this is this could encourage a society which tolerates the loss of life to save a life. So, these are the different viewpoints which are put forth. So, it is up to you to think of what is acceptable. So, when it comes to framing guidelines or regulations the ethical guidelines will be the driving principle and the uh, rules which would be put forth or the regulations which will be put forth should be driven by our ethical guidelines as a society. So, overall societal ethics would dictate what would be seen as acceptable for the society we live in. Uh, here I am only presenting the arguments for, for and against some of these points. So, I want to be very clear that uh, I am not uh, supporting or opposing any of the arguments and I am not interested in selling one of the ideas to you. What I am interested in is uh, for you to look at this and see that there is an argument then there is a debate which is going on and both sides have valid arguments and it is important to see both sides of the uh, argument it is important to reach across the table and 
find a compromise which will actually work for both parties. So, moving on to the next topic animal testing. Animal testing has long been an ethical question in bio research. When it comes to tissue engineering, it will again be a problem. Any time you were working on uh, creating tissues, you would have to test it before you can use it for humans. So, do we test it in animals? So, when we test it in animals, it creates a, an ethical dilemma. So, in the next lecture, we will talk about animal ethics, uh, so animal testing as the one of the ethical questions. Thank you.